Hello and welcome to our Hope Church service. Um, whether you're joining with us on YouTube or on Facebook or you're watching some other way afterwards, we hope that you are blessed and that you encounter something of God's presence, of God's grace, of God's power where you are today. Um, this week has been a beautiful week as regards the weather outside and really believe that there's something of God's grace in that, that we can take our children outside and go for walks and all of that. It's been absolutely amazing. I'm a wee bit burnt today, as you can see, red face and, and arms, but um, we're, we're okay and we'll survive. Um, also this week on Thursday evening, I'm sure you're aware that there was a, a vote taken in Stormont as regards abortion legislation. Um, many of our church family, um, you were so involved in filling out the consultation last year, also keeping up to date with what was going on through CARE and Hannah kept us well informed about that. And we have been praying about this for for these last few years as we saw this coming. Um, we really believe that Thursday night was a really positive step and something to celebrate and to give God thanks for. And I would urge you even this week, folks, as we go into this new week, there's gonna be conversations that take place as regards that. Um, so be praying that God would step in and intervene and, and see things change for the better. Um, so thank you for your prayers and thank you for being involved in this whole process along the way. There's still a bit of a journey to go and we're so thankful for the, the people who are on the front line engaging with that um, to display and demonstrate God's heart. Um, also this week is a special week for Ethan Bailey who will be 10 on Tuesday on the 9th which is incredible because I remember Ethan being born. Um, it wasn't long after I came to Hillsborough um, with Hillary and we remember that really, really well. So happy birthday, Ethan. Hope that you have a great birthday. Um, folks, we are going to worship God together through song. We're going to hear a children's story in just a few moments and then I'm going to be sharing from God's word. So have an open heart. Um, have open ears to hear what God might say to you where you are today. And also, one more thing, just before I forget, I was in touch this week with um, Jackie and Emma Wood. I was on the phone on Thursday with them, and they just wanted to pass on to the whole church family that they are so appreciative of all the calls and the texts and the things that have been left at their door, chocolates and, and boxes of things, um, magazines for Emma. They have both been so, so encouraged by all the care that they have been shown. So it just she told me to mention it to the church family and I just wanted to do that this morning. I'm going to pray and then I'm going to hand over to our worship team. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this opportunity today that we get to come before you, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We thank you that you are sovereign, that you are in control, that you are King over all things. And Lord, as we um, spend these moments before you, Lord, hearing from your word in various ways today and singing truth about who you are, I pray, God, that you would open the eyes of our hearts, that we would see you more clearly for who you are. Lord, I pray today for those people who are tuning in, and this week has been a really difficult week. I pray that you would bring them peace and comfort and strength in these moments. Lord, I pray for those of us who have known something of your grace and your presence this week in unique ways. I pray that we would worship you from the overflow of our hearts, Lord. And I ask you that if anybody is watching today that doesn't know you or hasn't come into a personal relationship with you, I pray that you would convict their hearts, Lord. You would draw them to yourself. You would make them aware that they're not in a right relationship with you, but that they can be because of Jesus Christ and all that he has done. So Lord, we ask that you would be glorified in everything that happens here in this service today. In your name we pray. Amen. i mm -hmm. 
to you see. He was strong, he was bold, he was courageous, he was handsome and the people loved him. Hooray, they said. God has given us what we wanted. We wanted a king who was strong and courageous in battle. And our story begins with Saul just coming back from a battle against the Ammonites and he had defeated them. And Samuel called all the people around and he said, now, God has given you what you wanted. And as long as you obey God and keep his commandments, 
everything will be well. But if you move away from doing that and you uh, don't hold to those commandments, God will punish you. And you know, boys and girls, Samuel knew that the people weren't really living the lives that they should have. They were not doing the things that pleased God. And therefore he decided, I'm going to give you a special sign about God and his power. And he said to them all, we are now in wheat harvest time and I'm going to pray to God to send us some rain and some thunder. And the people all looked at him and laughed. And they probably thought to themselves, there's no way that's going to happen. We never have rain in harvest time. But boys and girls, Samuel prayed. And when he prayed, God not only sent rain, he sent thunder, he sent lightning, and they were terrified. They knew that their lives, they had not been living them the way God had intended. And they ran to him and they said, Samuel, help us, help us. We are sinners and we need your help. And do you know what, boys and girls? Samuel said, I will help you. But you've got to remember that I have told you that you must serve the Lord your God with all your heart. Boys and girls, what a great lesson for us that we have to keep God's commandments, but also that we are to serve the Lord our God with all our hearts. Not just the little bits that we want to serve him with. Not just, well, I'll do this little thing or that little thing, but we're going to do it with all our hearts. And that's what God intended for the people. And Samuel told them. And he said, you know, this is a warning to you. If you do not do what God is telling you to do, he will destroy you and he will destroy your king. And for quite some time after that, the people did as Samuel had told them to do. And also Saul continued to be a very strong king. Well, do you remember this picture from last week? Daniel was telling us during our communion time about this pile of stones that was behind him in his piece of footage for, the, for our communion. And that particular pile of stones features in our story this week again. Not long after, boys and girls, another battle arose, this time against the Philistines. Great enemies they were, and their army was so strong and so huge. Saul's army, despite being so courageous, were really afraid. Some ran away and hid. Some others stayed and asked Saul what he was going to do. And you know, boys and girls, Saul didn't know. But what he did know was that he had been told to go to the battlefield and wait for seven days for Samuel to come and present a sacrifice to God. And he was to present it on a pile of stones like an Ebenezer, like the one that you can see in the picture that Daniel had in one of his fields. He had been told to go there and wait for seven days. Samuel would come, present a sacrifice to God before the battle, and God had given Saul strict instructions about this. But you know, boys and girls, Saul found waiting really difficult. I don't know about you, do you find waiting for things really difficult? Well, Saul found waiting really difficult, but God really expected him to do what he had asked him to do. And Saul waited the first day, the second day, the third day, and then he was getting a little bit anxious the fourth day, the fifth day, and by the seventh day, he got up and he said, I can't wait any longer. I'm going to offer this sacrifice myself. Boys and girls, he didn't follow God's instructions. He just decided, I can't wait any longer. I need to do this. And it wasn't long after he had offered the sacrifice before going into battle that Samuel arrived. And when Samuel arrived, Samuel said, Saul, what have you done? Now, boys and girls, 
I think I've talked to you about this in previous stories. Samuel was giving Saul an opportunity to really confess that he had done wrong, that he had not followed God's instructions as he had given them. But instead of that, he started to make excuses. He started to blame everybody else. He started to say, oh, but I waited so long. Oh, but my army was running away. Oh, but the other army were coming before us. But you know, boys and girls, Samuel watched and he said, what you have done is so wrong. And he left. When Samuel left, that was a real turning point. Boys and girls, look at the picture. How we look at Saul and what he's doing and look at Samuel and what he's doing. Samuel did not say, oh, don't worry, it's okay. No, he looked sternly at Saul and recognized that he didn't trust God to do what he said he would and he didn't wait. He disobeyed God and he went his own way. Saul, you have been foolish, he said. Because you've destroyed God's command, because and disobeyed him, because of your sin, God has chosen another king. Your son, Jonathan, will never be king. Oh my, boys and girls, how do you think Saul must have felt? I think he must have felt really sad at this really sad that what he had done and it was too late. Saul continued as king for quite some time after that and in a little while he then had another battle against the Amalekites and you know boys and girls Saul still had favour, still, Saul still uh, won that battle but again he didn't follow God's instructions. He didn't follow exactly what he wanted him to do and he disobeyed him. And when Samuel asked him about it again, he said all sorts of things. He blamed others. He said it wasn't his fault and all of those things. But it was so clear, boys and girls, to Samuel that Saul had moved so far away from wanting to follow God's instructions and God's plan and that really saddened him. And from that day onwards, Samuel left Saul and his presence and the blessing of God that was around him. Boys and girls, there's so many things in this story, but there are, so, there are just very important things that I want you to remember. The first one is that when we re read and we pray and we hear these stories, they're given to us for a reason. God has a very special set of instructions for us and we are to follow those and many of you know the Lord Jesus and have him in your hearts and that means that you want to serve him with all your heart and I'm so pleased at that but if we know him we want to obey him and we want to do what God has asked us to do. It also teaches us that we can trust God that we need to trust him with all our hearts. Even when we doubt that something might happen or might not happen, we need to trust him with all our hearts and know that he is a God that we can trust. In our church, boys and girls, we often talk about God never being too early and never being too late. He's always on time. So even if we have to wait for something and we have a few little times of patience, then we have to do that. And even as adults, we have to do that. And boys and girls, we have to learn that we serve a God who loves us more than anything else. And if you don't know him today, I want you to know him and you can ask him into your heart. We sing a little song or we sang a little song when we were younger, Stephen and I, and I know maybe it's a wee bit old fashioned now, but it's a lovely song and I would love you to learn it. And maybe your parents or perhaps your grandparents can teach it to you. And it's all about trusting and obeying God. And it goes, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus 
but to trust and obey. Boys and girls, see you next time. Bye-bye.
So we're going to look at God's Word now. And over the last few weeks, we have been talking about the church, who we are, and things relating to the church. Now I want us to move on to, now what do we do? Now that we understand who we are, now what do we do from here? With the shock of COVID-19 and lockdown and all of that, there probably been a period of time where we felt as if we were retreating. We know that the church buildings being closed isn't the same as the church being closed because the church is alive and well and, and flourishing and thriving. But I'm sure for some of us it's felt a bit like we're retreating, we're hiding a wee bit and maybe even, dare I say it, a wee bit of um, feeling like the victims in all of this. But folks, it's important that we know that we are not victims. We are overcomers. We have a purpose. We have a calling and we're not just existing or surviving and scraping through. No, we are flourishing and thriving because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in us. And he's called us to a purpose in these days. And I've seen that happen within the church in Northern Ireland and in the UK and across the globe. The church has risen in the midst of this to demonstrate something of the heart of God. And now I want to say this from the outset that I think for us to live in all that we are called to as the church, particularly for our own church as Hope Church, I believe that we will have to be willing to have a change of mindset in relation to some things. I think we need to have an expanding of our vision and a recalibration of how we even understand church and how we be church. And really be honest with ourselves. We talk a lot about honesty but really I think there are times and moments where we need to take a really strong look, really good look at ourselves and ask ourselves a few questions. Particularly as the church. And questions like this that I've been asking myself over these months. Do the things that I do and the things that I think are valuable, are they really valuable to God? Do the priorities and the desires that I have, do they line up with the priorities and the desires of God? Does my picture of who we should be as a church and as the church look anything like God intended? I've been asking myself these questions over and over um, during this period of lockdown and it's been very interesting to read some of your responses to the questionnaire that I've put up on the website. It's been interesting to see what things people prioritise, what things people want to be doing more of and what things people want to be doing less of. Very interesting. But I think we need to ask ourselves those questions. Do the things that I think are valuable, do they really matter to God? Are they valuable to Him? The priorities and desires that I have, do they line up with God's desires and what He wants? And does my picture of what church should be look anything like what God intended for it to be? My goal uh, as someone in church leadership is to help and equip you for the work that God has for you. To walk in all the fullness of what he's called you to. That's what my goal is, to equip the saints, which is you, for the works of ministry. You're called to ministry. You're called to something. You're called to live for the glory and the honour of God. And my role is to try to equip you to do that as best as you can. It's not to get you to sign up to a church and come along on a regular basis and just see out your days. No, God has called you to so much more than that. And this is what this series and this whole look at the church is all about and what I want to do today. Today, to guide our thinking, I would love us to look at the first few verses of Acts chapter 1. So if you've got your Bible, go to Acts chapter 1 if you would. Acts really recounts the early stages of the church. It gives a, a, a look, an overview of those early days and the type of things that happened and how the mission of God expanded and how the gospel went. Um, from Jerusalem to the outermost parts of the earth. 
And Acts is a book that recounts the working of the Spirit of God through God's people. The continuation of the ministry of Jesus after his ascension and the spread of the gospel. Acts was put together by a doctor named Luke. And it's the second part, if you like, of a story that he started in Luke's gospel. And this is the second part of that um, book, if you like. And it was written to a man, man named Theophilus. So this man, this dignitary, he seems to be quite an important person in the first century. And Luke is giving an accurate account of Jesus and then moving on to Acts and what happened afterwards. So we're going to read the first 11 verses. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote all about that all about what Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And when they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates that my Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid, them, hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And that's all the verses we're going to read. And we're only going to pick up on a, a small section of this. And over Tuesday night, we're going to go to the next part and then possibly next Sunday we're going to look at the remaining part. So um, don't be panicking if you think we're just going to look at a wee bit of this. We're not. We're going to look at it a wee bit more over the next couple of weeks. There's an interesting phrase at the start of this book and uh, Luke says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote all about what Jesus began to do and to teach indicating that there was still more to come. And then he goes on to into the book of Acts, where he recounts all that God is continuing to do. But now that Jesus has ascended, his work is still going on through his people and through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. But there's a phrase in here that I want us to pick up on in particular. The first words in a book are really, really important. I had a friend a few years ago who used to be convinced that if you read the first chapter in a book and the last chapter, that would give you a fair um, record and account and a fair idea of what was in the rest of the book. It would have saved me a lot of work at um, Bible college had I known that. But that was his approach, reading the first chapter and last chapter, and then you kind of knew what the rest of the story was about. And that's not far off in relation to the book of Acts. Because everything that happens in Acts from this point is a follow-on from what we have just read about. The disciples do wait in Jerusalem. They do receive the power that was promised. They do become witnesses to Jesus in Jerusalem and then outward until the very far reaches of the then known world. And the rest of the book tells that story. Let's look at the significant verse that I talked about. Verse 3. After his suffering... Jesus presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. First thing I want to say about this is that Jesus is alive. We as his followers and as his people aren't looking back 
to somebody who lived a long time ago, who's some sort of hero that was in the past and, and lived a life for a certain period of time and then just disappeared and that's it, the end of the story, but we respect him a great deal so we follow him. No, no, no. This Jesus that we worship and serve is living and is real. The, the grave could not hold him. He has overcome that and he has ascended to heaven where he's seated at the right hand of the Father. If you're not a Christian here today and you're a bit skeptical, and you're thinking, well, sure, there's lots of people in different religions that want people to worship them and want people to follow them. Um, this is just the same. It's not the same at all because Jesus is the only one that is still living. He is the only one who has conquered death. He is the only one who has performed the miracles that we read about in Scripture. He is the only one and unique Son of God. All those other people that claim some form of divinity or righteousness or claim that they're worth following don't amount to anything in comparison to Jesus, the one that we serve and one that we worship. He is alive and he is living and he is real. He is totally unique and that's why he alone can say, no one comes to the Father but by me. I am the only way, the only truth, the only life. He is exclusive and this is an exclusive message. But don't let that put you off. It's in that exclusivity that we see the absolute uniqueness of the gospel and of the person of Jesus Christ. He is alive. But it's the other part of that phrase that I want to pick up on. That he spent 40 days with his disciples after his resurrection and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. A few months ago, seems like just yesterday, we celebrated Easter. We celebrated the death of Jesus and all that that meant and all that that accomplished for us. Freedom from our sin because Jesus has taken our place. And we thought about that and all the implications of that. And then we celebrated on Easter Sunday the resurrection of Jesus. But something that often gets overlooked is the period after that resurrection Jesus spent time with his disciples. In fact, lots of people were able to see the risen Jesus. Lots of people saw this person who was a few days earlier hung on a cross, but was now walking around, eating uh, with his friends, talking to them over a period of 40 days. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Of all the things that he could have spoken to them about, the strategies, the structures, the ideas that he might have had, the leadership training courses he could have been running, the church planting strategies, event organisations, how to do this and how to do that. He doesn't do any of that. Instead, he speaks to them about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a major concept in scripture. In fact, kingdom in general is a major concept, but the kingdom of God in particular is an enormous theme of scripture. It runs f from beginning to end. Even in the Garden of Eden, when God places um, man in the garden, their mandate is to rule over, to have dominion over, to be stewards under God of his creation, to care for it, to look after it, to um, form uh, structures that are going to be conducive to the flourishing of all that would be in the world. And then we see the serpent that deceives and, and takes something of that authority, that usurps that position of authority and mankind is in some senses dethroned. The image is broken. This perfect world that God had made for mankind to rule over now what we see at the end of that awful moment of the fall is mankind with their tail between their legs going out, being cast out from what was theirs. And the whole of scripture, the trajectory of scripture is a restoration of all of those things that were lost. Um, that's, that's a sermon for another time because it's an enormous theme. But suffice to say it's really, really important and Jesus speaks to his disciples about the kingdom of God. Some people think that the kingdom of God only has to do with heaven and in the future and where you go when you die. And it's always a future thing. Some people think about it like that. And certainly the ultimate fulfillment of 
all that the kingdom of God entails will one day be fully realised. That day is in the future, the day when God puts right everything, when everything is, is as it should be, things are restored and put back in order. That final day we get to look forward to and that is absolutely true that the coming kingdom of God will one day in its entirety be fully realised. So it's okay to think about it in future terms but it's not only in future terms. The kingdom of God as Jesus spoke about it more often and also how the disciples understood it has to do with more than just what happens when we die. It's about the here and now as well. Predominantly in scripture when we are talking about kingdom and the kingdom of God it's in relation to the here and now. That's really really important. When we pray and when Jesus taught his disciples to pray thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It wasn't just a prayer for a future reality. It was also a daily prayer that they were to be reminded of the fact that their goal, what they were to do, was um, to pray for and to seek for and to ask for God to make his kingdom rule as it is in heaven, manifest on the earth in some way. And that's what we're praying for when we pray that prayer as well. Living for the king demonstrating his rule and his desires in the here and now. When life as God intended takes place, that is the kingdom of God made manifest. When, the, when life as God intended takes place, that is the kingdom of God made manifest on the earth. When everything is as God intends, every single thing, that will be the full realisation of the kingdom of God. And we've got that to look forward to. But in this moment, our role, what we do as the people of God and what we aim for is to bring something of his rule and his heart and his values to bear on the present that we live in. This is what Jesus was communicating to his disciples during the period of 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension. The bringing of the kingdom, the demonstrating of the kingdom, being conduits of the kingdom of God and the power of the king. This was to be their mission in the world and this is what they were to do after Jesus had ascended. That's why he wanted to make sure that they understood the mission. Now some people might say at this point, and maybe you're watching and you're maybe thinking in the back of your head, maybe you're not cheeky enough to say it, or maybe you'll send me a text message afterwards, will say, no, it's not about any of that, Bill. It's about proclaiming the gospel message. That's it. That's all they had to do. The rest will sort itself out. But folks, that's not the case. Because the proclamation of the gospel, the good news message that Jesus Christ has lived a perfect life, that he died in your place for your sins, that all you've ever done wrong has been taken upon him and laid upon him, the punishment that you deserved, he took for you and that you can know forgiveness right now, this very moment, when you turn away from your sin and turn to God. What happens when you believe that message is this, that you are born again. You're brought out of the kingdom of darkness and you're brought into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God. You're removed from under the tyranny of sin and the enemy. And you're brought into knowing life as God intends. Once you were enemies of God, but now you've been translated into this different kingdom. And you know God as your Father, and as your Lord, and as your King. And what happens when you become that new creation is that your values change. Your, the way you see the world changes. The way you see your neighbour changes. Everything changes. Your heart towards people is changed. And you begin to live differently. And in so doing, you then impact the world in a positive way because you're demonstrating and living out the kingdom values of Almighty God. And I'm talking mostly to believers here today. And that's the cycle, that's the progression, that's what should happen. That's why there's so many practical instructions within the New Testament about how we live 
Because if it, all that mattered was that you made a decision one time and then for the rest of your life or you were just waiting until um, you went to heaven, if that was it, then there would be no need for any instruction in the in-between. But the Bible is filled with instruction for the in-between. Because when we live out of our identity, we live out of the power that God has put within us to enable us to live that life. When we do that, we demonstrate the values of the kingdom of God and we demonstrate the heart and the character of the king of that kingdom. So the disciples were sent with this mission and this mandate to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, to proclaim the kingdom of the good news of the kingdom, that people could come out of one kingdom and know something different than another kingdom. And that is the hope and that's the good news. It's not simply that just make a decision, follow Jesus, get your sins forgiven and you've got your ticket and that's the end of the story. That's only the beginning of the story. That's only the starting point of all that God wants to do in your life. And I don't say that flippantly, I don't say that arrogantly, I am not making light in any way of the gospel. But sometimes the way we have talked about the message of the gospel, the way we've talked about what God wants to do in a life is limited to that boarding pass to heaven. And what has happened in the in-between then? We have forgotten about our responsibility in the here and now. We've forgotten about the Esther principle that for such a time as this, we've been called to the kingdom. We're, we're here in this moment because there's a purpose, there's a plan, there's something that God wants us to do. We see this really well and I've, I've alluded to this a few times over the last few weeks, but permit me to do it again. We see this really well in the story of Israel in the Old Testament. We see that what happened was... God brought a people out of slavery into a relationship with him. And at Mount Sinai, he gives them the law, principles, statutes, a way to live as his people. They were saved from slavery, but they were also saved to something, to inherit, to gain, to get something in the world that they were living in. God gave them systems of justice. Principles to welcome foreigners, corn at the edges of the fields to help feed those who were hungry within their communities and even foreigners from outside. He gave them rest days, holidays. He gave them family values and principles to live by. He gave them right standards of weighing commodities so that there was equal amounts paid and what was paid was what the thing was worth. And on and on it goes. A people who were set apart for God, but also to be seen by the nations around them, that lived around them, so as to cause the values of the king that they were in relationship with to be seen and experienced by the nations around them. See, the whole going into Canaan thing, the borders of the land, it wasn't simply so they could go into the land, put high walls up, live in that space, and that was the end of the story. The principal statutes and laws that God had given them to live by was so that the surrounding nations could look at them and go, there's something unique about that nation. They're knowing blessing. They're knowing fruitfulness in their crops. Their systems of justice and integrity are something to be admired. We want to follow that. And throughout history, there have been glimpses of the nations of the earth basing, especially in the West, basing their laws upon those Judeo-Christian principles and knowing some sort of blessing as a result because of equality, justice for people, um, respecting other people, systems of justice that made sense. So this was to demonstrate the kingdom rule of God. It was to demonstrate his principles, his values and his heart. And this picture is precisely what is to happen through the people of God in this day. Let's step back just a wee second. Now, I've given you so much stuff there um, because I've been thinking about this a lot and I've been getting a wee bit passionate about it, as you could probably tell. But let me step back a wee minute to give you a bit of an illustration. In this world, particularly this week, we can see the effects of these two kingdoms that are at war in our world. The kingdom of darkness. The kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. The kingdom of God. 
Both have their king, both have their master. And we see in our world the constant friction between these two, um, two kingdoms, if you like. This week on the news, I'm sure you've noticed that in the US in particular, the rioting on the streets in relation to the death of George Floyd. Now we know that this isn't just because of a moment, this isn't just because of the death of one individual, this is an outworking of the anger, hostility, bitterness that people have felt for prob probably much longer than even we appreciate. This isn't just a momentary loss of temper, this is deep-seated anger and rage against injustice and the perceived unjust treatment um, throughout the years. The result of all of this is the opposite of life as God intends. Instead, it's stealing, killing and destroying. It's the work of the enemy and his kingdom in the lives of those who have been blinded by him and who are enslaved to him and enslaved to their sin. That's what we see. The kingdom of darkness at work, taking away life, hurting, maiming, stealing, killing, destroying. That is the very essence and epitome of the kingdom of darkness. On Thursday evening, I don't know if you watched the debate in Stormont. Thursday evening, um, I watched a wee bit of that, um, the motion that was put forward by Paul Gervin, brought about by wanting to reject some of the impositions of the legislation that's been forced on our country from Westminster over this last year. I watched some of that um, and that uh, the law being passed as it was and being implemented would have led to the abortion of, of thousands if not millions of people with disability which was just even the concept of that, it's just horrendous to even think that a civilised society could even discuss that and even think about bringing that in. But on Thursday night as I watched that and I listened to people talking about the lives of the unborn in flippant and arrogant and selfish ways, I, I was appalled and I was grieved in my heart. It was obscene as they used this issue to try to throw punches at certain political parties. It was just horrible to watch. But what we were seeing was the kingdom of darkness at work, seeking to steal and to kill and to destroy and to rob people of life as God intends. But what I was also able to see in Paul and Robbie, what I was also able to see was God's people bringing the values of the kingdom of God to bear on the world that we live in. The vote was taken and it was 46 for and 40 um, against. So it was very, very close. And you imagine if the believers within that setting had have remained silent and hadn't have stood up for those people who couldn't stand up for themselves and hadn't have spoken out, where would we be now? This is a demonstration of the kingdom of God working through his people to bring God's values to bear on the world around us. We need to understand this, that we play an active role in that. We play an active role in that. And when we don't speak up, when we do what Esther was tempted to do before Mordecai used those famous words to her, if we don't speak up, then who is going to speak up? We are ambassadors of the kingdom of God. We are the ones who know his heart and know his ways, know his values, know what he wants. So we have a responsibility to do something about that. And I really, really appreciated those men talking the way they did, going to the effort that they did and they continue to do going forward. This is what it means, folks, to be part of the church of Jesus Christ. This is what it means to be part of the, the church of Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God is the opposite of murder, bitterness, rage, malice, selfishness, manipulation. Instead, it's love, peace, reconciliation, freedom, justice, righteousness, forgiveness, joy, hope. These are the things that God approves of. The things that he calls for, the things that he calls us to. Jesus spoke 
and used phrases like this a fair bit when he went about doing good and healing people and setting people free during his ministry through his word and through his power. He used phrases like the kingdom has come near, the kingdom is among you, the kingdom has come, the kingdom is in your midst. He defined what it looked like when the kingdom of God was near. What we are to do as his people who follow the leading of our king is to live out and demonstrate the values of the kingdom. We are to continue the ministry of Jesus. We are to continue to see people set free. We are continue to speak with grace to the broken. We are continuing to speak justice and righteousness into our society and into our land. We are to continue the stuff that Jesus began to do and to teach until he was taken up into heaven. How does this look practically? And I'm, I'm moving to a close now um, in just a few moments. How does this look practically? Now I think there can be many varied ways in which the kingdom of God is demonstrated. I think that miracles can be a way that the kingdom of God is demonstrated, but not the only way. I think a, a lot of time we make excuses um, and we get very frustrated because we're not seeing miracles and we're thinking that if we're not seeing the miracles in the way that Jesus saw them, then we, we can't really do anything. Um, that's not the case because there are certain people in scripture that did an awful lot of good but still didn't see miracles on the level that Jesus did. Think about John the Baptist who was filled with the Spirit from his mother's womb but didn't do any miracles but made the crooked path straight, ready for the ministry of Jesus. We think about Paul, who is probably the most famous Christian that has ever lived and penned most of the New Testament. There were certain situations where miracles didn't happen for Paul, and I'm sure he would have wanted them to, both in his own life and for people who he had to leave sick. There were certain situations that where he was betrayed by people that he trusted, Alexander the coppersmith doing him great harm and he didn't seem able to conjure up a miracle in a moment to sort something out. He had a thorn in the flesh. He had to leave Trophimus who was really really sick. There and Timothy he had to advise him in a medicinal way rather than performing a miracle and sometimes I think we, we um, make excuses for ourselves because oh I can't do miracles we're not seeing miracles, therefore what good can I be? Because Jesus was only bringing the kingdom when he was doing the miracles. Not true at all. In fact, some of those most poignant moments that we read about in scripture, thinking about the woman at the well, was a conversation with a broken woman that he brought hope to by bringing truth, also bringing grace. And her life was turned upside down as a result. Think about the woman who was caught in adultery, thrown at his feet, about to be stoned and in Jesus' wisdom he turned that whole situation around. So it's not only through miracles that the kingdom of God comes, it can come in very different ways. I think of acts of mercy and acts of justice, speaking the truth, caring for the broken and the poor, giving to those in need, educating those people who wouldn't get an education otherwise, providing homes for people, performing surgeries for people. I think all these can be ways in which God's rule and his values are made known and his kingdom are demonstrated. I think loving our families well, in this society in particular, looking after our children, respecting our spouses in a world that is, is doing the opposite. They, those are the things that point to something different than what the world is seeing. Breaking down barriers of sectarianism are ways in which the kingdom of God can be demonstrated. Think of people even in our own fellowship, maybe watching this morning, and I'm going to embarrass you a wee bit, but I think of people like Julie and Murdy, who are in the process of going through fostering and, and that whole journey and, and wanting to do that and are at the latter stages of that, who have volunteered with homeless people down in Belfast for the last few years. Think of DJ and his company, seeking to restore broken communities through buildings and through centres and hubs in the most run down of areas, especially down in Belfast. Think of Robin speaking up for our persecuted brothers and sisters all around the world, raising awareness, raising finance, raising prayers for those individuals. 
that's all kingdom stuff. Think of Lynn and Celestino as well, sending money, sending encouraging letters out to Guinea-Bissau and, and ministering and encouraging those people out there on a consistent basis. Kingdom stuff. Think of Kitty as well, gifted and skilled in the whole area of medicine and pharmacy, going out to Tanzania a number of times to just be a practical support to people who are, are so broken and in need of support and of help. And there are so many more engaged in a um, mission of demonstrating God's kingdom upon the earth. God is pleased with that stuff. God is delighted in that. That's his goal. That's the end goal. That's what he wants from us. That's what he's calling us to. And I think when I said at the start, I think we need to expand our vision and our perspective. I think we need to move beyond creating a comfortable church environment for ourselves to enjoy services and to have things the way we want and to have all these different areas where we are served and where we are helped, I think that there's an aspect of that okay, but if that's it, then we've missed the point. The church, that church, the establishing of churches, of hubs, of places where we can meet together, is really meant to fuel us for the real mission. The, the, the church is only the hub. It's only the, like the airport hub where we come in as planes to land, to get re refueled, to actually go towards our destination. I'm stealing that from Reggie McNeil. Um, I heard him use that analogy and that picture and I think it's absolutely brilliant. But we have made the church the destination, the end goal, but it's not. It's only the midpoint. And I think that's what it means to have our vision expanded, to have our thinking expanded by God. What is the thing that's on his heart? What is he calling us to? And what does it look like? What does it look like for you? I've mentioned a few names there. And if I haven't mentioned your name, it's just because I haven't got time. There's so many within our fellowship that I look at and I see the work of God taking place in their lives. I see a heart for things. Rosalina, is, I was share, or hearing her share about some of the community stuff that she was doing at the prayer breakfast she was sharing on Saturday morning. That community outreach to really vulnerable people. That's kingdom stuff. That's, that's where it's at. That's what God is calling us to. Don't miss what it is that God's calling you to. What he's put on your heart may well be the purpose that he has put you on this earth for. So to summarise this really long point that's actually going to bring us to the close of our sermon. The disciples entering into a relationship with Jesus and our entering into a relationship with Jesus is not the final part of the story. He didn't tell them to just stay looking up into heaven as he ascended and the angels didn't say, guys, just stay here, set a wee um, booth up, you know, get your camping gear, just, just wait here, see out your days, looking up into heaven, just waiting for his return. They didn't say that. In fact, they said the opposite. They said, why are you standing looking up here? Jesus will return again. That was what they said. Get on with things, basically. They were to continue what Jesus had started. And that was what Jesus was speaking to them about, those 40 days in between his resurrection and his ascension. They were to proclaim the message of the gospel so others could participate and come into part of being and part of that mission of spreading this good news of the kingdom, demonstrating the kingdom that would have an impact on the world. And down throughout the ages, and I'm veering off really quickly, but down throughout the ages, the church was on the front line of ministry to the sick, ministry to the poor, education, even music. The church, that was how the church was growing and developing and flourishing. That's what it did. Because it recognised, that's how they understood it, those early believers. They understood that they were to live out the values and principles of the kingdom of God in all these different ways. And we have abdicated our responsibility in that. We've passed it on to agencies here, there and everywhere. We have sat back and thought that we were getting on with the spiritual things when really we were getting away from the spiritual things which pertain to the kingdom of God. I said at the start about the importance of the start of a book and at the end of a book. Let me just read how Acts ends. Acts 28 verse 28. Therefore I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. For two whole years 
Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And that's the end of the book. The book has travelled from these believers having a conversation with Jesus for 40 days about the kingdom of God. And here, a number of decades later, we see Paul who has preached to the Gentiles, to the outer regions of the earth, the known earth, our known world at that time. And he's proclaiming the kingdom of God. And he stays there and the, the word spreads and there's no hindrance to it. And that's the picture of the book and that's where it ends, just like that. And Luke is a doctor and everything he writes is intentional and specific. And many scholars believe that he ends the book there like that because the, the book gives an invitation to those who are afar off, who can come and participate in this. That it doesn't end, the mission doesn't end. Oh, Paul finished it, that was it. Do you know, chapter closed. Many scholars believe that Luke ends it in the way that he does so that other people will be drawn into being a part of this story. And that's certainly what I believe, that we are people to continue this ministry, to continue this demonstration of God's values and God's rule in our world in these different ways and to all different types of people. It's an enormous task for sure. It won't be easy. There are going to be hindrances for the believers, and there were within Acts, lots of hindrances. There will be people who welcomed them with, with open arms, and there were others who wanted to kill them. And when we look at the mission field, if you like, if we, we look at the need in areas of, say, abortion, of health care, of children who don't have homes, of broken families, of um, mental illness, all that stuff within our society and we're looking at that going Bill are you saying that we are to engage in that stuff and, and make a difference there? I'm saying that the gospel of Jesus Christ is still the power of God onto salvation. Salvation as a whole thing, wholeness, meaning, purpose, restoration. I'm saying that the gospel of Jesus can still transform our society and transform those areas of society that people have given up on. And I'm saying that he's doing that through his people. But there was one key thing that we read about at the start, that these people, these believers would need if they were going to be effective in this mission. And it's the same thing that we need to constantly be dependent upon. Of course, I was going to say I'll tell you on Tuesday night, but you know what it is already. It's the person of the Holy Spirit. And we don't have time to get into that this morning, but I want to do that on Tuesday evening, follow on. How are we going to fulfill the mission? It's enormous, it's massive, it's going to be challenging, it's going to be difficult. But we have a power within us that is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and the same power that was present in the creation of the whole universe. And we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I want to explore that and explore what that looks like. Because last week it was Pentecost Sunday and maybe people were thinking, oh, we should have made more of Pentecost Sunday. The trouble with us Pentecostals is we limit the work of the Holy Spirit to a particular day, a particular moment. And we all love the big moments, but the Holy Spirit is not just for the big moments or dates on a calendar or conferences or extended worship times. The person and power of the Holy Spirit is to be a part of our lives Every moment of our day, if out, without him, we would not be able to do anything. So there is an intentional aspect to not doing the big, um, let's go for it and let's focus on the Holy Spirit today. Because I want that to become so ingrained in who we are as a fellowship, more than just momentary stuff. So we're going to look at that on Tuesday night. Please do join with us. I'm going to hand you back to the worship team for just a moment as we sing our closing song. I count on one thing. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things 
things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me. working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy. Oh, Choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names, and nothing can stand against. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names, and nothing can stand against. And I choose to praise. to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names, and nothing can stand against, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Folks, thank you so much for joining with us today. I hope that you've been blessed. I know that the sermon today was a fair bit longer than I had intended. I really do apologize for that. My clock um, had stopped halfway through and I got lost, but I was just so passionate about it. I just wanted to continue to share. So if you have needed to cut it and go back and revisit it, that is totally fine. Um, but I am conscious that watching something for a wee bit longer can be a bit more difficult but hopefully you were blessed and you were encouraged and you were challenged and hopefully something of the heart of God has has um, resonated with you today. I've thought about this stuff a lot as you can tell and over the next few weeks we'll be looking at different aspects of this. Um, uh, coming up this week on Tuesday night as I said in my sermon we're going to be looking at a particular aspect of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit so please do join us on Facebook for that. Following that we're going to be having a prayer time over Zoom. We'd love, you if, love it if you could join us um, to pray together after Tuesday night. So we start on Facebook Live at 8.30 and then our prayer time usually starts about quarter past nine 
Um, so just be aware of that. Don't miss out on that. Also Wednesday morning then we have our kids worship time at 10 o'clock. It's been a really great thing that we've been doing. Um, join us for that on Facebook. And then on Thursday evening we have our worship time again led by someone from our worship community. Then we're back next week at 10.30 um, with our service. Hopefully you have a good week. Stay safe, stay blessed, and as always, if there's anything at all that we can help you with practically, please just get in touch. See you soon.